Welcome everybody to our connection series. Uh, today's conversation is with the brilliant Chester Osborne. Uh, now Chester is, as I'm sure you're aware, the chief winemaker at Darrenburg. A born and bred South Australian, um, fourth generation winemaker has been raised amongst the vineyards. Um, and we're so excited to be here today. Uh, if you've been to South Star in the past, um, Chester has joined us as one of our wonderful speakers. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Chester and Craig, who are right behind me. Oh, this is the way to do it. So um, we've been doing a number of these as part of this connection series to reconnect with people and kind of see how they're falling out from the year. We're very lucky to be able to be doing this in person here and certainly with this wonderful glass of wine, which is a, a luxury in today's time for it's sure. It's the first one that you've done with a glass of wine, isn't it? This is for sure. It was the first one in person. So, this oh, is, cool. so we're, right. we're just knocking out of the park already. So we can just Oof. turn it off right now and this has been a win. Um, so I, it, it, there's so many directions this can go, certainly because I just know um, as a fellow uh, psychonaut and looking at someone who I consider a psychedelic winemaker and, <laughs> and thinks Floyd's one of the best bands ever, we're likely to go into some interesting territory. Um, before getting into the reality, I guess, of where the world is now and, and that stuff, which we don't need to gripe on, I'm just really actually curious if you can remember your first glass of wine. Oh, um, no, I can't, but it was, I would have been really young. <laughs> That's um, what I wanted to get to. <laughs> yeah, my parents, I, I just remember wine around dinner time a lot, and um, I didn't ever, I wasn't given a lot. Sure. But uh, I do remember uh, stealing lots of it when I was seven years old seven yeah in that shed there actually i used to climb over all the wine stacks with kids and friends and whatever from school and i remember um finding we we, we pulled out some bottles and the kid who was with me said do you ever drink this I said oh, i rather did a table bit and he said well why don't we now all right we had a you know, we all had pocket knives so we had a swiss army pocket knife open the cork you know Hopped in and went, wow, that's pretty cool, actually. And it, we must have grabbed a really good bottle because <laughs> most of the time, wine well, was pretty, didn't really like it then. So then we used to hide it under trees and you could do a tree crawl. You had your own stash. Yeah, so yeah, you had you know, a sparkling wine, then a white hock, and then a burgundy, and then a fortified musket, and then a port. So five different trees, like a tree crawl. And, uh, and, and that was what we did. Uh, and, and, you know, First time we did it, everyone got pretty drunk because we're seven years old. <laughs> <I would imagine. laughs> and uh, from then on, we all took it a little bit easier. And uh, yeah, it's, it was actually a good way to really understand where your limits are in alcohol. For sure. Well, it's interesting. You know, I spent a lot of time in, in, in Spain and certainly a part of the culture there is at younger ages to have an appreciation for it in, in, in moderation. But it was always like you kind of said around the table. And I'm curious when you talk about the sort of wine is life philosophy, what role do you think? that wine plays with regards to the connection between humans? Really important, um, I think. <laughs> Maybe I'm a bit biased. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my kids, um, we sit and talk for an hour or so after we've eaten um, in just any normal night and, um, and chat about stuff that was you know, interesting. Uh, work, we were doing some sort of artistic something or someone read something or whatever, you know. It, it, and, um, and, but it, it usually extends if we have a bottle of wine or two or three. Uh, but if, uh, if, it's, if they're not drinking, then uh, it ends a lot quicker. So it's a social lubricant, there's no doubt about it. For sure. And if I think, as you know, for the last couple of years, we've had events here to really go all in, spend hours and hours doing that. And I think we sort of see that same semblance of uh, being a lubricant, yes, but also it's, it's uh, an influencer to conversation in, in, in the setting and the environment, right? I mean, and, and here we are inside of a, a crazy environment, certainly. Um, when you think about the role that you've taken with wine and as a winemaker and as a businessman, and as also as an artist, where do you see that intersection really being valuable in terms of integrating creativity and art inside of the technology and understanding of wine as a, as a product, really? I think even outside of the tourism side, which obviously the Darren Big Cube was all about attracting tourists. And, uh, and so, you know, they bought lots of wine and <laughs> that was the idea so lots of wine but but it, but it's bigger than that because it, it while you are here you actually um i suppose it just exudes generations so you even without even if you didn't read anything you've worked it out 
um, subconsciously that it's four generations because there's so much old stuff and, 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 uh, and generational noting stuff. And then the, the whole idea that wine is artistic is, is oozing through the hundreds of, of art pieces here. And you can, you know, you can, if you really want, you can download the app and you can listen to me telling you why that art piece relates to that wine label. And, and so that that's, that's all just adds to it. But, but everyone in business, it's really more important than ever to rely on arts because otherwise you're just being another business that is just the same as anyone else or any, any boring one else, I should say. It's art that, is, that colours our life yeah. and that uh, separates us. And otherwise, we'd all be wearing the same clothes, we'd be talking the same thing, and we'd all be going to bed early. You know? Well, not to have sex necessarily, although that's another art form. <laughs> but, uh, but, no, the, uh, but I think um, you, uh, you need to really try and hone in on what, you can, what your product is that is what its artistic side can be and throw and, and really amplify that and, and accentuate it. And it, it's like it happened, we started doing it, I suppose, back in the 80s um, with uh, Cooley Our Wines, Old Vine and uh, Ironstone and High Trellis and Darry's Original. All these names all came about um, because we wanted to just give it an extra um, bit of panache and worth calling it Darry's original after my father's name's Darry and it was his original thing. So, you know, and football, the horse that my great grandfather had sold all the horses in 1912 to buy the property. And football was a, an all right horse, bet, the best name to call the wine. And so now people, when they go to a bottle shop, they go, I have a bottle of football rather than I have a Darenberg Shiraz. And they might take the third bottle to drink before they go, what is this football about? And then they'll read the back right. label and they go, oh, it's a horse. Oh, that's really cool. And then sometimes their label names are quite quirky and funny, like the Senosilicophobic cat. Yes. And, and so that's a fear of an empty glass. And, uh, and people, again, they may not really worry about it till they have th three or four bottles. Mm -hmm. And then they've gone, oh, that's really cool. And so it's suddenly got more interesting for them. And then they start using it and telling other people about it and say, hey, you know, this is named after a, a cat that Chester had called Booze. And the real name was non-alcoholic Booze. They called him Booze for short. Right. So this is, this is part of the storytelling, right? And, and how, yeah. many, how many different bottles, how many different wines currently you have in production? 76 different wines. Are still and see, see, what I find amazing is that that's 76 unique products that have their own story and narrative to them, yep. whereas someone that might be creating a startup or a company, they're really concerned with just one narrative. So, I mean, there's a lot of practice that goes into that. But I think what you're hinting at is there is that there's something very human that ties into the story, which is a part of the allure and the attraction. I mean, how do you go about that process I mean, in terms of it's creating all, that narrative? It's all to, part of the intellectualizing of the product because today in this information age, if you don't intellectualize it, if it's not something deep about it, I think people get a bit, all oh, right, been there, done that. And you, and especially if you want to be around for generations, you've got to keep making the story more interesting and keep evolving. So hence new products and new names and, and new packaging, maybe slightly, all those sorts of things are all part of the importance. But at the beginning stage, when you've just got one product and, and, uh, and there's you, then it might be partly how you got to that and, and incorporating that as an artistic expression. Wearing loud shirts, you know, it's one yes. of the things I, I always do. It. It's just, I've always done it. I've always worn loud shirts. My, my mother always clothed me in really loud clothes and I was fine with it and I never, never grew out of it, whereas my kids grew out of it. But, but you know, that's something that, that's become people sort of... Do you feel that like that's something? instilled a confidence in your ability to do that? You think that was a nurtured element that led to the way that you look at expressing whether it's a blend or a wine or your dress? Um, I suppose it's both ways in that, it, it, you know, having already done it, well, it's like, it didn't kill me. So yeah. it makes it easy. But also my mother was quite artistic and, and quite zany and full of uh, eccentricities. Yeah. And uh, I think I inherited quite a lot of those. I did actually do a personality test and found that I that come uh, back? It came that the person been doing these tests for 30 odd years and said, you know, you got the perfect score for extroversion. <laughs> I went, well, what does that mean? That means when you go out, you get energy. And when you stay home, you lose energy. So, um, you know, introverted people the other way around. So, so extroversion. Um, uh, 
meant that, I, yeah, I gain energy by going out and doing things. And, and by wearing louder clothes, just puts more energy into the environment even more. So, then, you, know, you know, I might have a hangover. I'll put a loud shirt on, I'll call it a hangover cure because everyone will laugh and talk about it and, and they're, they're hyped up. That hypes me up. That gets rid of the hangover. Do you think that extroversion in that need to go out has led you to a lot more experiences as a result of that, which has then fed to the creativity then? or Yeah, I think not only is it going out, it's actually exploring things a little bit deeper and further and crazier and finding more, um, more crazy things to talk about. Because at the end of the day, when you're going out for dinner uh, with people, you don't just want to talk about, oh, I sat on the beach in Darwin or wherever you went, you know. You want to talk about the crazy, funny things that you know. And, uh, and I think that uh, makes life just more stimulating. So extroversion is a fortunate thing in that sense. Mm -hmm. I'm also, uh, also Asperger's, but uh, that I've managed to sort of get over the negative side. Well, there is no real negative side to Asperger's, other than that you can be socially awkward, but you can get over that. And learn to be a little bit. But what's more that? What does that mean? I mean, oh, you can, <laughs> that's like defining what normal is at, yeah, at that well, point. Well, yeah, Asperger people sometimes are really can be read people's emotions wrong, and and really be quite upsetting. Gotcha. And uh, so, but you can learn that gradually. But Asperger people also are so into detail that that's actually part of their problem. Is it's just too much detail for them, and so they. They're often um, can't read properly and do lots of things not well, you know, whatever. I started meditating back in the 80s. To Still meditate? It. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my daughter and I do it every night and uh, I do it in the mornings when I can too. So, um, and uh, it, it's a, it was amazing for removing the, the negative sides of, uh, of um, Asperger. So, so then, uh, the, Apparently, Asperger is the next um, evolutionary stage that we're all heading toward. Right. And if you look at the Asperger people in, in politics right now, <laughs> Trump and, uh, and Boris, you know, uh, Johnson, and yeah, it's becoming the norm. People, people need that. You know, it, it's such a stimulating environment. It's sometimes hard to cope with all the, all the stresses, but Asperger people love information, that really feed off information. Well, it and, cuts through the noise as well yeah. for participants and voyeurs, I suppose, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and getting back to the product, you know, selling a product, you've got to be obviously have a good social media presence to make an impact with your product. And you've got to have artistic carry on craziness to make it an interesting story. So yeah, art, it's just, all comes back to art, whole of life. Otherwise, we haven't got art, we're just coasting along in neutral. Well, there's an, there's an interesting and really intertwined relationship between art and humanity. And I, I would argue, and I think it's that human authentic part, which is what I think people resonate with, whether it's an idea, it's, it's, it's a product. Um, you know, I was thinking, I mean, so 2020, right? <laughs> The last time we were here, and certainly having these stories uh, in person, uh, things have changed a little. I'm curious with regards to the future that you were thinking about last time we may have sat down, how, how you view this, the future, just generally what your views on the future are outside of what's happened, but just how you've grown and evolved to think about you know, your role as yep. a merry yep. winemaker. I'm very fortunate that my mother had these interesting philosophies that out of every bit of bad that happens, twice as much good happens. And so I feel I'm a very optimistic person. My father is leaning pessimistic. So that's actually a good combination in business to have both. Mm -hmm. um, means that I have to work harder to justify situations and you know, do cost benefit analysis. So that works really well. It's another hint that you know, maybe good business you should do. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but my mother, yeah, so every bit of bad, twice as much good happens. So COVID, you'd say, well, you know, what, where could be the twice as much good that's going to happen? Well, out of this, we obviously all have to um, keep stimulating um, to keep employment. And that may get over climate change. I mean, that's really where we have to stimulate all the money is to make our efforts to stop climate change because that is obviously an enormous problem that um, I've been understanding for a long time because viticulture, grapevines are great barometers. They're very sensitive to climate. And so we've seen it coming. Every winemaker in the world knows that vintage is now, the picky of grapes is now a month earlier than it was 40 years ago. Mm. That's a massive problem. Um, yeah. 
And so, uh, and that's only one degree. We're talking a few more. So, 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 yeah. The positive side of COVID is that then we, I think, there'll be a lot of injection into making sure that we get on top of climate change. What, what's the connection that you think people will jump on to to affect change with with climate? Well, obviously, it's going to be all sorts of batteries, and batteries aren't just you know lithium ion. I mean, you know, it's water storage, pumped hydro, that sort of thing. Obviously, hydrogen is a possibility. It's an expensive way right now. I think it's probably a lot more, I mean, it might be practical eventually, but there's a lot more practical ways of, of storing energy. You know, just refrigeration. Most places have refrigeration. Storing cold, every house has refrigeration mm -hmm. in, in, well, in Adelaide because it gets hot. Then maybe it's just a storage of a, of a water bank of minus something degree um, uh, liquid. But then at night, at night time, you can just pump that through your evaporators and uh, and uh, put it into the into the environment. So you know, that's cheap cheap uh, um, use of solar energy, and uh, and so there's masses and masses of batteries. That's that's where we're going. Obviously, the the new announcement about gas fire um, power station that um, that has been announced to happen is, is a good interim thing, but it could be a very short interim thing. And if hyd hydrogen becomes an issue, that's good because it can just apply, go straight into the hydrogen. But I, I, I don't think it will. I think I think these other battery types are going to be a new age thing that will help um, with uh, greenhouse gas. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating because the way that you speak about technology, and certainly we, we've talked off camera about a lot of the, the technological things that you play around with, yet you have this sort of interesting balance between traditional human process to, to making wine, whether it's basket press. I mean, there's a lot of things that you do. How important do you think the role of technology is and what role should humanity play in that convergence of those things with regards to solving, whether it's wine production or whether it's solving climate change? What's, yeah. how do you view those so, two so aspects playing together? It's really interesting because people often ask the question with wine making, is it science or is it art? And I say, well, it's all art. We just use science to make the art. And really everything we're doing is art. It's just, we use science to make our artistic world the way it is. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, science is the way of solving our artistic problems. Yeah, I don't know whether that's solved. <laughs> that's that question or does it No, I just, it's, it's more just, an, it's, an, it's just interesting to, to, we look to technology in some regards to solve problems, but ultimately is the humans that have to be thinking about how to solve that problem to begin with. And it's just sort of that weird marriage between what's solving it, the humans that have the idea to control technology. I mean, this is just more interesting. And even you talk about some of the AI stuff you're playing around with, and certainly we're coming to a time where AI is accelerating at a point, which I think most people are not aware of where it's going to cross over that. that it sounds like yeah. if we don't keep ourselves aware of the human art creative part that is unique to us versus computers, what kind of a future are we facing? One of the things that is really interesting, having knowing my father, he's 93 years old and, you know, technology was really a problem for him. You know, computers, a nightmare for him, of course. And, and you know, everything is moving logarithmically and always has in evolution of humans. It's always been logarithmic. And, um, uh, but we as humans think linearly. And so we can't cope with that unless you start trying to think um, logarithmically. So think ahead of the curve all the time, then that's going to help your business wise, obviously. Right. And, uh, and so um, it, it's important. AI, uh, um, oh, sorry, AR, I should say, mm -hmm. augmented reality and virtual reality, which we were talking about earlier on, um, that's going to become an enormous thing shortly. I mean, it's already starting to be um, quite affordable, but it won't be long before we'll be sitting, um, you'll be sitting right there uh, virtually, and I'll be sitting here, and we'll be able to point at things together. In fact, you, you, we might be in front of a machine, but you know how to work that machine really well. I've never seen the machine, and you'll actually be virtually there, and you'll be pointing to different parts that I have to move around and do things with. That, that Does that is, excite you? That, oh, yeah, very much excites me because it's, uh, it means that we can be so much more productive. Um, it'll be a medicine as well. It'll be amazing what we can do in medicine that way too. What's, what's the impact on going back to that idea of sitting around the table as a family having wine versus a, a world that starts distributing and in, in, in that sense, do you think? You invite someone else in to sit around the table. We have a few other people around the table virtually, virtually? there. Absolutely, yeah. Do you, th um, do, you th do you think that there's something missed from a, just a, a neurological perspective of how 
all the things that are happening that we don't even are, aren't conscious of. Do you I think can't that's... touch them. That's the only difference, but I'm not going to touch them anyway right now because no. it's COVID. <laughs> so it's no different. I can see them. We can point to things. We can laugh and talk as if you're, you're there. So my so you're, com ability... you're, comfortable, you're comfortable in a virtual world where there may be less human contact. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. It's still human contact. In fact, it's more human contact. Um, How so? if, if I, well, if I can see you, that's human contact. I, I, it's exactly the same as you being there. It's not exactly it's, the same. Well, all right. Good point. I mean, You're not there in the flesh, but you'll react exactly the same as if you are there. So therefore there's no, my, my mind is being fooled. <laughs> right. But even when we did the, the elbows, we, you had a name for that. Oh yeah. I call it the B.O. Hello. Right. Because I'm waving B.O. at everyone every time I pull my, <laughs> but, but, but that, <laughs> and I'm sneezing but, into it and having it on you. <laughs> but that's missing from a virtual world. I mean, that's just one small aspect as, as humans that, you know, I just find it really interesting. I, your adoption or appreciation for that type of connection wouldn't wouldn't actually be something I would have expected to have heard from you. It's interesting. And it's funny because my my house is very modern tech, like this place. Mm -hmm. It's now twenty years old, but right. like it's really spacey and whatever. And then my other house in Adelaide uh, is really old, very old, antiquey sort of house. And people go, I wouldn't expect you to want to be into rugs and antiques and right. whatever. And I go, well, you know, explore every part of yeah. life. And I love beauty is beauty and you can't deny it. And every, you, know, you don't have to be just one format. You know, it's mm -hmm. best to explore every format. So with all the change that everyone's been facing this year, um, and sort of that opportunity comes out of... Uh, negative situations. What are some of the things directly that, that have, you've been thinking about with regards to how as a business, as an entrepreneur, um, you can adopt or find ways to, to make progress? Yeah, um, well, really this AR, VR thing is getting really exciting. Um, I was, we've been filming 360 degree video of each of our single vineyard wines. So there's 20 single vineyard Shiraz wines that go in to make up the dead arm, like mm -hmm. they're all the components of the dead arm Shiraz, which we're really known for. But each of these single vineyards, so we've got film all year round, three times uh, a week, um, the whole seasons of each of these vineyards. And we will, so we've condensed that down to 12 minute videos. And we've got a video of each of the label names as, as an animated real thing or real animation, if it can be such. Mm -hmm. and again, that's a little bit virtual. Uh, and, and so you, you could have three vintages of this wine and sit there and, um, and be in the room, seeing all the seasons and everything and watching me walk out the road of heights. Well, now um, that AR and VR is so much closer, we can do that in venues, wearing a headset and having the glasses in front and, and you can, you know, you'll even see your hand and you can be doing it and you'll, you can look around everywhere. But even further than that, we can do this via our phone. You know, we yeah. can, um, and then everyone can do it. Millions of people around the world can do it. I mean, we're doing augmented reality on here now um, mm -hmm. where you can hold your phone up. Every sticker that has a little orange mark like that on, on our bottles, hold your phone up and you'll see an artistic um, video carry on. All the, all the lines all change on the label and then there's all this other thing that goes on that right, relates to that wine. And, uh, and so that, that has re is reaching 4 million people or 4 million bottles have been yeah. sold with that. And that means it could be 10 million people who, who have been impressed with some sort of technology and then they'll say, hey, I'm going to buy another bottle and show someone else. So we've found sales are going really well since we've introduced this. Uh, That's this amazing. So did you feel like you somewhat doubled down or, or just became more active thinking about that as a result of the situation we're in? Did it accelerate that process or? It's hard to know, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we don't just, know what we'd be doing. Evolving, yeah. yeah, exactly. But certainly being sitting around um, more at home, normally I'd be three months a year, you know, basically from May, June through to September, there'd be about three month period where I'm overseas and just doing dinner after dinner, telling stories. <laughs> um, which is great fun. Sure is. <laughs> been quite a lot of Darabin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not much other wine, but, no. but, but lots of Darabin. But, but, but that, but of course, that hasn't been doing. I've been doing them all virtually. Yeah. I've been doing five uh, virtual tastings a week for months now, all over the world. It's amazing. And they, they've got the wine, and I'm in, in my room with a weird painting behind me. It's a little bit pornographic, actually. <laughs> my head my head blocks out where most of the penises are. <laughs> you know, now now I bend over here. Yeah, well, you poking you from well, behind well, it her. When I, when I move. I didn't even know that they had penises on that painting. I just love the style of it because it's quite abstract. But then when you look, you go, oh, my God. Yeah. Anyway, so that's my background. And I've got props for every label name. 
I pull them all out, like a dead arm that crawls along with a spider on it. Yeah. And uh, all these things are all just quirky and fun and, and caricatures I hold up. So, so I've been doing these virtual tastings and often I'll go to dinners around the world and, and try and get the, the right person along and you'll get a junior from the store instead of the real buyer a lot of the time because right. they get so many invites. Well, now I'm getting the buyers. Right. I'm not spending a cent. Right. Uh, they're, the wine's being sent to them. They're in their own house. So from a business and perspective, you're getting much more intimate, more direct With the real people who your make your customers difference. in your market. Yeah, and, so we're, and now we're starting to see print media saying, hey, Australia, you know, and Darren, you know, it's like, Right. So um, yeah, media, we're doing media things and whatever. So it's, uh, yeah, I think we're actually connecting extremely well. It's well, I think it's an interesting well. opportunity because, I mean, again, as an outsider that's just recently kind of come to Australia, I, I have sort of identified that there's less, certainly than North America, less of an understanding or uh, appreciation for how you can connect globally through the internet. A lot of it is more national sort of thinking. But here you're sort of seeing right off the bat, I don't have to travel, I can save time, I can get more direct stuff. Do you see that no matter what happens is a way that you may continue to do business to be able to take advantage of that? I mean, obviously you're still gonna to wanna to have the dinners and, and the stories for sure. It's probably gonna happen both ways. I'll probably right. be working nonstop every night, every day doing dinners all around the world. I, I don't usually open bottles up when I'm doing my virtual dinner because I know the wine so well, I don't really have to. Right. But, uh, Occasionally, I think I should be because yeah. I'm watching everyone else getting drunk and having fun. <laughs> but, As it's uh, eight in the morning in your time zone. <laughs> that's exactly right. Some people want me to do it like three in the morning, like London wants me to do, always yeah. do it three o'clock in the morning. It's like, well, if you want me to make any sense, probably not. I'll probably be just getting back from somewhere. But, but the, uh, the other thing that I've really, really uh, enjoyed about uh, COVID, which I shouldn't say that because it sounds like I'm being a little bit too, I mean, it's a shitty time, but we're yeah. very fortunate here. Indeed. obviously in South Australia, but, but uh, the, the thing that not traveling is that I've been able to explore all my other artistic things that I'm doing. So I've been wanting to write a book for 10 years, a science fiction to promote Grenache. It's called The Unbelievable Grenache. So I've uh, now finished the whole first draft of that. And, and the book has grown enormously. It's not only the science fiction, it's got another whole science fiction I wrote like 15 years ago in there as well. Jesus. And it's got the journey of the cube, the design journey of the cube. So 50 pages on that and, uh, and the quirkiness of that. And then all of our wines are all going to have two A4 pages of each wine with puzzles to work out, songs that I've selected and I've written poems to tie the song to the wine. And, and so I've just like got this whole big massive artistic book that I, we're, uh, we're on the verge of finishing. But the science fiction that I've written, I've got a uh, you know, handwriter and I've got a girl type it out and she's about two minutes of the way through and she's just going, oh my God, what are you on? <laughs> like she's just getting into it, she's loving it. Is it the first time you've been asked that question? <laughs> I get asked that all the time. And the funniest thing is everyone who knows me knows that I don't go near any drugs at all ever like if i walk into a room there's dope in there i'll walk straight out because i know that it just affects me um too much i won't sleep at all for days if i just get enough whiff of it you know? yeah so, so yeah I, 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 i'm hyped up enough you know yin and yang you got to get it right yeah, for sure it's the uh, the meditation to balance the the energy mm -hmm. but the with with dope, you know, a bit of marijuana flowing through me, then it's just too hard it's to skewed. balance that. Yeah, it's skewed, yeah. And I guess, so, I mean, as a result of being able to do business in this new sense, which saves you time by not traveling, you've just been really able to adopt that creative aspect or nurture it in a time when you just normally would never have the opportunity then. Yeah, exactly. And I think you, with so many shitty things happening around, you know, the news every time you listen to it and, you know, there's bad stories around. The um, then I think you know, the best way to overcome that is through art, is through doing art. You know, just um, when you when you lie awake at night or something, then um, you don't want to dwell on the negative things, whatever. Mm. The best thing is to think about the sculpture you're about you're in the process of building, yeah. and and then get even deeper into it and actually turn that negative energy that was starting to get a bit hot into really a great positive yeah. opportunity to create something that is really cool. So often I'll get up in the middle of the night and be sitting there writing up all those thoughts. I mean, it's a form of meditation on its own, really, when you're focused. But it's, it's interesting that you've adopted that, where it's for a lot of people, for good or bad, have found themselves into a very um, consumptive process where they're just consuming, consuming, consuming. And I see a lot of friends losing a bit of that edge. Um, what, 
any advice in terms of how to how to stay focused when it's so easy to get distracted by news or by the next yeah, thing that yeah. rolls out of Netflix well, or whatever well, when you're trapped uh, at home? And in business, when you you know you start your business, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of fun, hype, and you know you've got a plan that you know, hopefully <laughs> that you're sticking to, or it gets modified all the time and you know, it goes along. But you will always in business find trying times where it really it, it feels like why am I doing this? It's too much, you know, and 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 it starts eating at you and you're not sleeping well and then you keep thinking of the problems and and then the next day you know you're not focused properly so that's where I say meditation and uh, thinking of art I mean there's uh, there's great philosophers who say actually um, anxiety and depression is really just the inability to think of a future hmm. is all they're saying it is and so by Art is my thinking of the future because this is something I'm going to do right. in the future. And so it's a possible future. And it's a simple future that everyone can suddenly do. And I, so I go to auctions and buy lots of junk all the time. My garage, it was like you could not move in it. It was just boxes on top of everything. There's an old 1973 450 SL Mercedes there covered. No one could see it. <laughs> and so with COVID, I put massive amounts of racks, organized it all. So now it's all there. And now when I'm doing a sculpture, I just go, all oh, right, I want something crazy to is. add to that. I'll go through all the boxes and go, oh yeah, I can add to that. So one of the ones I'm doing for the football Shiraz, I've got a go-kart, an old antique go-kart. And I've put a car uh, jack thing there as a body for with um, two hand um, drills as arms. I've got this big vase that I've stuck um, irrigation things on and teeth as are, uh, are, um, um, shells and there's a funny little grill and, and egg cups, wooden egg cups as ears and, and, and I've made out of Meccano V6 engine and it's got you know, football magnums in there with, um, with uh, Pour, uh, spirit pourers coming back to the body, you know, and it's sitting on a uh, horse, um, the, you know, the horse figures of chess uh, with bolts of shoes bolted onto them, whatever. So it's a football, you know, with yeah, the horse, yeah. the football was a horse. So, and, so, and, and so, you know, that, those sorts of things. And I find, find that really stimulating to, uh, to keep to thinking on. about. So do you think that all this time that you've explored in your own personal creativity, I mean, I mean, we're sitting inside one of the most iconic, crazy, creative things <laughs> in this part of the world. Um, have you, do you have ideas for what you, you, you think you might want to do creatively with the business? Outside of the, some of the interesting stuff, certainly with the, the AR and some of the VR stuff, is there something? Yeah, that, I have plenty of ideas, actually, well, but I can't tell sure any of them <laughs> right. right now. Gotcha. I don't want to give my father a heart attack. <laughs> he always <laughs> thinks I'm spending too much money. He always right. talks about it. But, you know, I just find the situation and, uh, and we move forward. But, uh, but yeah, I've got, I've got plenty of ideas going forward. And, uh, and there's all sorts of ideas, not, a, not even within the business that I'm working on, that, uh, that I've got um, uh, I'm part of a few ambassador groups. And I've got council uh, ambassador group working on some really important things that we can change in the uh, in McLaren Vale that would uh, really important. So, Fantastic. No, I can't go into too much. No, about very it. good, and we won't we won't prod you for that. I think we're getting a note that we're we're kind of hitting the Q and A time. Um, <laughs> Danny, you got some probably some pretty interesting questions. I'm going to guess <laughs> coming in. I do uh, now. Hopefully, there's not too much feedback, so I'm going to keep this really quick. Um, Chester, how is SA's wine industry, wine industry doing in comparison with the rest of the world in current times? Uh, would you say that we're ahead of the curve? Is there any country or countries that we should be taking inspiration from? Uh, what is, what's your pulse check on the, the state of SA's wine industry? Well, yeah, it's really actually not doing too bad. We're fortunate in the wine industry that um, you know, in a recession, people drink. You know, in good times, they drink. So, so yeah, there's really no time that people don't drink. <laughs> um, they have uh, moved down the scale a little bit. A lot of drinkers, you know, people aren't necessarily buying as much full on high end. high end. Although we've had some great awards. We won the best wine in the world in London for our 17 dead arm. So that's actually really gone well when we just launched it. So that's really helping our top end wines. But, uh, but, um, 
a uh, yeah, Australian wine sales are still going really well. I think uh, most wineries I talk to are doing all right. You know, we we got JobKeeper for a little bit because of the um, really bad April. It was awful, awful April, and uh, and you know, it was a little bit slow in March too. No, March was good. Sorry, April, uh, May. That's what it comes after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, May was a little bit slow. So so, but now you know we're all sort of doing all right. The big worry is, of course, the tensions with China right. and whether there's going to be a tariff put on the wine. That, that's going to cause a lot of mayhem in the wine industry in Australia. But Australia, I think, is doing a lot better than most other wine countries are talking. South Africa, they shut the industry down. They just said you, no one's allowed to drink in South Africa for ages. Um, I didn't hear that. Yeah, how did they, all, how did they make that? Well, they did that because a lot of the uh, a lot of fighting happens amongst the uh, local people there, and they and so the hospitals are taken up with a lot of hmm. people who are injured. But the hospitals were needed for people with COVID instead. So they said, don't drink, and then Jeez. we won't have as many fights, and then we'll be able to cope with all the COVID people. And so and maybe also. They weren't a social, so you know maybe that helped too. So so they did that, yeah. So that and they weren't even allowed to export. That's a weird thing, but but um, yeah. And I've heard a lot of bad stories about European surpluses, um, massive surpluses. So yeah, it's uh, it's been hard for some. Uh, here in America, though, you know, direct sales are up a lot um, uh, from uh, Californian wineries and whatever. So you know they're not doing too bad. I haven't heard what their total volumes are, or whatever. But, but Australia is really quite doing blessed well. now because mm -hmm. um, you know we're all still allowed to party mostly. Yeah, Victorians much. are joining in now. They're getting used to the idea. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we've got another question about um, the way, you know, obviously with travel restrictions and border bans and all of that jazz, um, have you seen an uptake in SA tourists wanting to explore their own front door? Yeah, good question. Definitely. Um, so the Derenberg Cube is seeing about 50% of the number of people we normally would for the last few, fair few months. Uh, which is pretty good, really, considering there's no international visitors, no New South Welshmen and Victorians. So uh, that means they're all South Australians. Um, we notice also the South Australians are a bit more tight with their money. <laughs> and don't spend quite as much when they come to the tasting room. Um, but, uh, but yeah, 50%. We, I was surprised, actually, that so many people. Mm -hmm. I've got another one. Sorry, I'm managing mine. <laughs> Sorry, this mic back and forth is interesting and apologies if there's any feedback. Um, we've got a question from Kirsten. Hey Chester, I love how you apply your creativity uh, to so many areas of your life. Do you feel that meditation acts as a moderator for enhancing your creativity and ultimately your winemaking? Definitely it grounds you and gives you more energy. It gives you more energy, but it's a different energy. So I'm always hyped. Now that can be, as I mentioned before, yin and yang. So too much yang and you're hyped and it's not quite as clear as your meditative uh, energy, which is more peaceful and calm and, and, and very quick. You become very quick when you meditate all the time. You become very quick to make decisions and you make the right decision all the time. It's just so easy. You don't have to ponder it it's just like bang 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 yep clarity you know yeah yeah and you know the right road it's just easier whereas when you're hyped up and whatever someone tells you something then you you're hyped and you're, oh i've got a feedback oh you know it's like you know you can just imagine it's it's complex to to get your head around it all and you might miss something you know it's not a it can't be as deep and clear thought and thoughtful so, mm -hmm. yeah. how did you come across meditation yeah, that's pretty quirky. It was actually at Salopian Inn back in the early 80s. And um, a fellow by the name of Ian Collett, who um, his father had Woodstock Winery in McLaren Vale. I was talking to him. I grew up with them as kids because they were involved in the winery, or at least the father was. Um, but uh, anyway, I was down at Salopian Inn and, and Ian mentioned to me that he, how he doesn't like to get too drunk you know, because it interferes with the meditation. I mean, oh, what's that? And he told me all about it. And then someone about four months later set up a meditation course in McLaren Flat and said, do you want to come along? I went, sure. 
they said no obligations, whatever. Yeah. Four days later, uh, or four weeks, so four one day yeah, week so. thing, um, uh, I learned how to do it. It's simple as that, and you've got it for life. I've never yeah. you never have to go learn it anymore. It's there. It's just a meaningless mantra word that you repeat over over faintly in your mind, and and uh, your mind goes into a completely different wavelength of thought. Um, that is uh, that you feel everything wash out, just anxiety just falls out of you like that. As you as you suddenly go into that deep trance, it just like goes and disappears. And you just do it sitting in a chair. It's not it's nothing too heavy or complicated about yeah. it. It's just a beautiful thing. Then and and, uh, and then after that, you've got more energy and, and clarity of thought. The, the difficulty is in how easy it is. I think for most people. Yeah. Well, uh, they say it's everyone can do it. All my kids can do it. They're all being taught it. Everyone I've talked into doing it does it and loves it. And yeah, it's it's an amazing thing. It's just so easy. So uh, it is. But so I mean, right. we grew up in a time where we didn't have the kind of onslaught of notifications and all these things pinging <laughs> at us. I mean, you, I mean, I, I I wonder myself for my children because certainly it's something I would love to introduce them to is whether they'd be impacted by the fact that it's just such a fragmented, multi everything world. Whether it becomes hard to sit with your thoughts or lack of thoughts. The hard thing is, I think, actually being dedicated to actually have that 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes practice, at night. The discipline. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I do it with the children because they, and they don't even hesitate, like, yes, I'll do it. You know, um, they, they want to do it, yeah. but they have this sort of other side of them that is tied to a computer <laughs> or the yeah. phone that says, no, you don't really want to do it. <laughs> yes. yeah, there's a whole program on that, isn't there? The yes. social... Uh, aspects of how they've taught us to be reliant on our, on our phones. Whatever. I think the, the meditation actually has also helped me in, in not being addicted to my phone as well mm -hmm. and uh, put priorities right. Nice. Last question, more of my own personal interest. If you weren't destined uh, for the wine industry, um, obviously with your family history, born and raised along the vineyards, what do you think you would be doing? <laughs> I've been asked that question a lot of times and I always said a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I didn't. Well, I, I won a singing contest with another guy. It was not really a singing contest. It was a karaoke <laughs> contest, but it was a year long. And oh, wow. uh, so, you know, it was the finals. And we didn't practice. We, we didn't even have a choice of the songs. Actually, but, but anyway, no, I'm being silly. I'm being silly. I'm, there's no way I'm going to have a music career <laughs> in that singing and whatever. But uh, but yeah, I think uh, arts arts would be what I'd be doing if I wasn't a winemaker. So photography would be one thing. I uh, I won the best black and white photo in Australia in 1979 in the National Schoolboys Championships. And uh, I was offered a job in photography, but I wanted to be a winemaker, so it didn't really happen. But, uh, but I love photography still. You still pick up the camera? And... Yeah. Well, nowadays, you know, with a, with a great you know, iPhone 11, I mean, yeah. you, just, you, you don't really need no. a high-end camera. You can do so much with that and play with it so quickly afterwards. So, so yeah. But no, I, I think I'll focus more on wine making as my art and all the sculptures. So I've got about yeah. 60 sculptures yes. in process right now. That, um, in process. Uh, in process. Oh my gosh. There's about four <laughs> that are going to be finished in the next few days, and uh, and they're all, you know so yeah all these crazy things that are, and I like taking time with my sculptures because I add to them and sometimes I combine them into one whole <laughs> sculpture. Two things become a better story as uh, right. and a better object as one. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, unless any other questions that would conclude. Regular programming. Is that correct, Daniel? That is correct.